Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning. Uh, in the last class, we had derived the expression for uh, the unsteady uh, variation of pressure in the rocket motor. Right? Uh, we had considered the mass balance uh, in the rocket motor to derive this equation. In this class, let us look at uh, how we can use that uh, to predict what is the time required for ignition, what is the time required for extinction. Okay. Uh, till now, uh, we had looked at only the steady part that is the burning in the steady portion. Right. This class, let us look at the uh, other two unsteady portions that is namely ignition and extinction. If you look at a typical thrust time curve or a pressure time curve, This is uh, ignition time and uh, this is extinction time now in this class let's uh, try and use the relations that we had obtained in the last class to find out how these vary okay uh, if you remember we had derived the equation for pressure variation as If uh, let us say the motor is operating at the equilibrium pressure itself, let us say it is operating somewhere here, then this Pc, this Pc is a time variant term, okay. this is not an equilibrium quantity, this Pc will also be equal to the equilibrium Pc and as a consequence these get cancelled out and you will get this dPc by dt as 0. Okay. So, in this equation, we had identified uh, the V c by A t as L star and this entire term as uh, 1 by T c, right, 1 by characteristic time. So, we can write this as Now, let us say how to use this to uh, get what is the time required for ignition okay, and what is the time for extinction. Uh, before we go there, we should understand this that uh, why is this important in a rocket motor. Okay. Ignition delay, let us say if it is 
a very long time, then also it is a problem. If it is a very short time, then you can have a very high pressure burst in the beginning and then uh, therefore, uh, uh, affect the structure. Okay. You could actually burst the motor in that time. So, either, uh, the either of the two is not uh, what we want. We want to operate it in a very narrow window. Okay. Typically, even in a large motor, the ignition should be over within 100 milliseconds. Okay. 100 milliseconds is the uh, time that we are looking for. So, let us try and derive the expression for the ignition time. Now, uh, during ignition, if you look at this portion, this is a very small time as I said it is less than 100 milliseconds. right? So, if you are looking at that kind of a time scale, uh, one can make this assumption that the chamber volume and the burning surface area and C star do not change in this period. Okay. Uh, v C is chamber volume, V C changes only because of burning. In 100 milliseconds, it does not burn too much. So, uh, V C and A B will be nearly the same and C star if we assume, we will assume constant. I can write this term P C equilibrium 1 minus n as follows. where k n is equal to a b by a t. I should also add here uh, the throat area also does not change with uh, time in this case. right? During the initial phase of ignition, it is a very small time and uh, we are not looking at hundreds of seconds. So, the burnings, the throat area also does not change. So, in this case k n will be also uh, constant, this entire term is a constant and I can absorb it as alpha, I will call alpha is equal to rho p k n a c star. So, if I want to find the time for ignition, all that I need to do is integrate this equation. Now, uh, the limits of integration need to be identified. Okay. Typically, the uh, igniter is supposed to give something like 30 percent of the uh, pressure rise. Let us say this is this equilibrium pressure is 100 bar, uh, the igniter should give something like 30 bar on its own. Okay. So, around 30 percent of 
equilibrium pressure. So, if we integrate this we will get T ignition is equal to integral This is the one by uh, or T C into sorry T C into this. Okay. This is the equation that we need to solve, and alpha we have identified what it is. So now we need to uh, play a little bit of jugglery here. If you look at uh, the denominator, we can express this as let's say x is equal to P C to the power of one minus n. Okay, then what will be dx? Dx will be one minus n into P C to the power of minus n d P C. Okay. This equation I can rewrite this as T ignition is equal to P C. P C to the power of minus n d P C, then I will be left with alpha minus P C to the power of 1 minus n. Okay. So, if I use this here, this is nothing but the same equation rewritten. If I now use this, substitute this here. I will get I can change it to the x variable integral x ignition to x equilibrium. Okay. This is nothing but d x by 1 minus n. So, I will get T c by 1 minus n. and uh, this is alpha minus x. Okay. Now, we can see that uh, uh, this is in the you can integrate it and get a logarithmic function. So, I will get alpha minus okay this is the form we will get uh, please note alpha is nothing but this one or this is also equal to right alpha is nothing but this this is also equal to p c equilibrium to the power of 1 minus n. Now, if you put that back in this equation here you will find that the denominator is going to 0 or the time will go to infinity. Okay. So, you cannot have uh, infinite ignition time. Uh, so, therefore, what is usually done is 
we try to uh, reach something like 95 percent of the equilibrium pressure. What is the time? So, we calculate time required to and that will give us a realistic ignition time. Okay. So, this is how uh, we calculate uh, ignition time. Now, if we want to look at uh, what are the kinds of igniters that are used in the industry, yes. It starts from 0. I said 30 percent of the uh, pressure rise will have to be given by the igniter itself. Uh, that pressurization is done by the igniter itself. If you have the chamber volume, 30 percent of that initial pressure rise has to be given by uh, the igniter itself. When the igniter burns, it should fill that volume up to the pressure of typically something like 30 percent. So, it usually starts from somewhere here. So, we are looking at uh, this rise only. Okay. Now, let us look at uh, what are the kinds of uh, igniters that are available. Okay. Uh, there are two kinds of igniters, one is called as uh, pyrotechnic and pyrogen. Typically, the pyrotechnic igniter is based on gunpowder. It is a derivative of the uh, gunpowder and this is nothing but a composite propellant with thirty to forty percent metal loading. If you remember when we discussed about composite propellants, we said it has typically 18 percent of metal loading. Here, the metal loading is increased to uh, something like 30 to 40 percent. So, that uh, the way this operates is it is not only the hot gases that come out, but also the hard, hot metal particulate matter. They go and embed themselves on the solid propellant and they start a local ignition process. Okay. So, that is why you have a larger fraction of metal content in these propellants and uh, usually they have very high burn rates. Uh, if you look at very small motors, then uh, uh, pyrotechnic is used, medium sized you have a pyrogen igniter and uh, in large uh, solid rocket motors like PSLV stage 1 etcetera, what you use is you have this pyrogen igniters moving on uh, rails from the head end to the nozzle end, so as to ignite the entire motor. Okay. Now, if you look at what happens when uh, the igniter is switched on, the 
if you look at a rocket motor the igniter is placed at the head end okay and uh, as i said it also has particles that go and embed themselves on the propellant when these particles embed themselves on the propellant uh, they cause local ignition in addition to that there is a hot gas flow in the chamber okay so both of these uh, lead to ignition and if you look at uh, uh, the igniter, igniter will have something known as both the kinds of igniter will have something called a squib which is made of uh, this is sensitive to current and is usually made from uh, lead azide or mercury fulminate okay. so uh, when the current is supplied uh, this is sensitive to that this starts to burn and then ignites the rest of the uh, igniter and then this igniter will then ignite the rest of the motor okay as i said uh, if you look at uh, a motor like this we said that uh, the ignition time needs to be even for a large motor less than 100 milliseconds right and i said uh, in the beginning that uh, if we let's say don't do this in the 100 milliseconds then what happens if there is a slower ignition then we could uh, uh, get into combustion instability could set in no, sorry one minute I said this has to be completed within 100 milliseconds now uh, let us say we have a certain igniter mass right if we put in the required igniter mass we can achieve this within an arrow band let us say we put something more than what we should have put okay then what happens there are two things firstly if you look at a motor of this kind okay a port motor if you have a very large l by d right if you have this length of the motor to i'll consider this diameter as important and not the overall diameter primarily because this will be the port it gases that are generated here if you remember this equation that we had derived uh, dpc by dt is equal to 1 by tc alpha
this minus portion what is it due to? This is because of flow going out through the nozzle, this portion is because of burning right. Mass addition due to burning and this is because of Now what happens it takes time for this to occur right, if the length is especially large, length to diameter is very large then it takes a longer and longer time for uh, the flow to go out and therefore if you look at this equation the term that is contributing in a negative sense is not going to set in for a long time. As a consequence you will have in terms of pressure versus time let us not worry about this portion. This is going to increase in this direction with increase in L by D right because it is going to take a longer time for the gases to go out and therefore the pressure keeps on rising and this pressure overshoot will become higher and higher and at some point could be detrimental to the motor. In some cases of uh, large L by D motors this is known to be one of the modes of failure of motors. So, one needs to take care of this, so as to provide ignition such that this does not happen also. Okay. The other trouble is uh, with regards to ignition, if you look at this figure this is of a simple port, yes. No, I am only looking at uh, this, it depends on the volume too. But if you have the same volume and if you have a long pipe right, if you have a stubbier volume the same one and a long pipe, then if you look at both of them this is what you will find right, that is what I pointed it out. This is also in some sense similar to uh, if you have a tank overhead tank and if you have a very long pipeline, the changes at the other end will be felt after a long time right. So, uh, that is the reverse problem that is happening here right. Coming back I was talking about uh, this motor here, if you look at uh, the trouble with ignition this is a very simple motor right, we have a cylindrical grain. But usually we talked about this earlier if we want to get the required thrust time curve then the motor uh, then the grain has to be either a star grain or a phenocell or something else right which means that uh, uh, you are going to have cuts here and cuts here and you have to ensure that uh, the hot gases or particulate matter flows into all these uh, crevices and ignites the entire motor in the very short time that is available which is not very easy actually okay. So and in addition let us say due to some reason we do not uh, supply the pressure that is required by the igniter, let us say we fall short then uh, it is known in to go into an instability mode okay. If you do not supply it the required pressure then it goes into the instability mode. So either if you give it more pressure you could have a hard start like what uh, we talked about or if you give it a lower ignition it could go into instability mode. So we need to have the right amount of ignition energy so as to provide uh, typically something like 30 percent of the initial pressurize as well as provide a smooth ignition. Now we can calculate what is the amount of uh, igniter required based on this formula.
the igniter mass is given by 1 minus SF PC ignition now if you look at this relationship the SF stands for solid fraction it is assumed here that the solid fraction does not give rise to the pressure right. So, you have to count that out and uh, then you will get the pressure rise that we are looking for this has to be typically 30 percent of the equilibrium pressure this is the chamber volume and uh, this is ignition uh, the uh, temperature at the end of ignition ok. So, using this we can calculate what is the amount of igniter that needs to be carried so as to get a good ignition. Now, let us look at the other end of the spectrum that is uh, the extinction part ok. We have looked at uh, the ignition part the other end of the unsteady process is the extinction let us look at that now. If you remember when we discussed about uh, burning of the web and other things we discussed something known as liver loss and I said uh, this is uh, something called unburned propellant ok. Uh, now, let us uh, find out why certain portions of the propellant do not burn and stay like that although it was burning up to some time and suddenly why does it quench itself ok. Now, uh, if you look at a missile or a launch vehicle both of these have the objective of placing uh, its payload uh, at a particular orbit with a particular velocity right. So, uh, as I said earlier that uh, it is more so with missiles than with launch vehicles the temperature uh, varies from place to place as well as day and night ok and as a consequence the burn rate also varies. Now, with all this you still have to place it into the orbit at a given velocity and at a given altitude which means that if you could have in some sense a possibility of cutting off the thrust ok then it would be a lot more easier it is very easy in liquid rockets that is you just stop the supply of the liquids or also in hybrids one of them is a liquid. So, you stop the supply of the liquid you will be able to stop the combustion process, but how does that happen in a solid is what comes under extinction. But before we uh, do that let us find out what is the time uh, it takes for the extinction after extinction the depressurization right. If you look at the pressure time curve we are talking about this time ok. What is uh, observed here is that the combustion is completed we will see why should the combustion get completed at that point a little later. Now, if the combustion is completed what happens to the burning surface area? Burning surface area we can assume it as 0 a b is 0 then what happens to alpha in the equation that we had derived in this equation what happens to alpha? Alpha is nothing but rho p uh, a b by a t 
a c star if a b goes to 0 alpha also goes to 0. So, alpha equal to 0 then uh, if you look at this equation what do we have this term goes off and we are left with minus p c by t c. So, we get the equation as Now, we can integrate uh, the equation uh, uh, and find out what is the time. It is a very simple you get l n p c must be equal to minus t by t c. Please remember that the t c there is a constant. Okay. So, you will get this which means that p c follows an exponential curve p c we can write it as uh, p c equilibrium exponential of minus t by t c that is uh, the pressure here decays in an exponential fashion and please remember this equation is valid up to what point of this drop up to the point where the throat is choked. Okay. If you remember the equation uh, that we had is for a choked nozzle. right? So, this is valid up to the condition where the throat is choked. Now, this time is uh, of importance because if you look at uh, either a multi stage launch vehicle or a multi stage missile, uh, when you cut off the stage, right, uh, if it is still burning like this, because the weight is very small, it could accelerate and come back and hit the mother vehicle, the remaining portion of the vehicle. So, you would not want that to happen and you would want to know what is this time in this time it can still be thrusting right the pressure is decaying so it could still be thrusting and you don't want it to come back and hit the vehicle right so th in that sense this time is of importance now coming back to the question why should propellants quench uh, when they are depressurized or uh, why does it quench uh, or why should there be a sliver loss right if you uh, remember our discussions earlier we had said that there will be some portions of the propellant that will remain unburnt if you look at the If let us say this is the cross sectional view of the rocket motor, there will be some portions that will remain unburnt. Now, to ask ourselves this question why should it not burn? Up to this point it was burning, right? And why does not it suddenly uh, or why should it suddenly stop burning? The answer lies in this fact 
that suddenly the burning surface area decreases. If you look at it, it was earlier occupying the entire uh, this entire uh, circumference and suddenly it ceases and becomes only in some portions that you have a propellant right. So, what happens the burning surface area a b suddenly changes if a b changes suddenly and if you have a propellant with high n or a medium n also I mean burn rate pressure index n is moderately high right not we are not looking at 0.8 or something we are even if it is 0.3 or 0.4 what happens to the equilibrium chamber pressure when this happens huh? when the a b suddenly changes or it is a larger burning surface area and suddenly it decreases to a smaller burning surface area if you look at our expression for equilibrium pressure right so if ab changes uh, suddenly then the pressure also changes suddenly and if ab drops pressure drops suddenly in a sense you are depressurizing the motor okay so people have done this uh, experiments and try to find out what happens in this case what happens when the motor is depressurized or when a propellant is depressurized this is one of the ways in which you can stop the propellant from burning further if you depressurize it prevents the burn uh, propellant from burning or it inhibits the propellant from burning later on let us see why this should happen. it is something like this let us say a propellant is uh, this is the burn rate versus time that I have let us say a propellant is burning at some rate here suppose you depressurize it okay then uh, at the lower pressure which you bring it to let us say it has a burn rate something like this right it has been known that if you do this process in a very small time that is if your dpc by dt is large right then the propellant tends to quench if you do it very slowly it will go to this burn rate if you do it very rapidly at some point it could uh, do this okay if you do it further rapidly it is seen to quench like this okay so there is a critical dpc by dt beyond which the propellant ceases to burn and people have uh, kind of uh, done the study wherein to find out if let us say you have an initial pressure and uh, this is the dpc by dt the curve follows something like this if for an initial pressure somewhere here if you are using let us say this depressurization rate then 
it will uh, it will quench but uh, let us say if you are uh, for the or it will not quench and let us say if you are this is not quench and let us say you are here this will lead to quenching in a sense this line defines the boundary at which uh, the quenching or the not uh, not quenching happens okay so this line de uh, defines the boundary at which quenching and no quenching takes place so if you are above that it will quench if you are below that it will not quench and also please remember this quenches still even when there is a burning possible at that lower pressure it is not as if we are taking it below a pressure where the propellant ceases to burn right the answer for this is in some sense uh, in the <coughs> characteristic time of characteristic uh, conduction time scale that is uh, the for the solid the characteristic time scale is much much greater than the characteristic time scale for the gas we will discuss this a little later as to why it should be for uh, the solid it should be higher than the gas so in a sense the gas responds very quickly to the changes whereas the solid is very very slow and responding to changes typically it is of the order of a of uh, 100 times or 1000 times 100 to 1000 times. Now what happens in this case is if you have these gas respond very quickly let us say we have the situation wherein the propellant is burning in this fashion let us say there is a flame here now if you depressurize this the flame tends to move up because the pressures have reduced and the flame tends to move away from the surface when this happens but the solid tends to feel that uh, it is operating at the previous condition itself and tends to pump in more gases as a consequence you are filling in more inerts in a sense and this uh, causes the flame to move even further away whereas uh, if you look at what happens inside the solid the solid will need more and more heat to operate at a lower and lower temperature so in a sense you are moving away from the situation where at the point where it was burning uh, the solid was getting the ample heat that is required for it to continue burning you are now moving into a situation wherein it needs more heat than what it is getting and the heat is also decreasing so in a sense you are pulling away from the stable point and therefore it tends to quench okay that is the reason in some sense for this quenching we'll stop here and continue in the next class the next class we will discuss uh, erosive burn okay thank you <coughs>